heard of coronavirus. The, the biggest retail landlords and funds were openly talking about massive challenges that they were facing in terms of retail property values, which were slumping fast. And it follows then that, that COVID-19 has had a substantial impact for anyone who's interested in commercial property. Uh, and, and as, as bricks and mortar retailers, at least to, to a degree, um, everyone here has a, an interest in that. For occupiers of commercial property, clearly the challenges that we've faced have been vacating offices and shops and factories and warehouses. But getting back into these properties is going to be uh, perhaps an even greater challenge. And we, we've already heard that there's so much focus on what, what our shops and uh, retail outlets going to look like when we get back to, to trading. Uh, and Lynn will, will speak about the health and safety challenges shortly, um, all, all of that being such a priority. But it's no surprise that there, there is a level of paralysis in terms of property transactions and, and, and Paul's mentioned that in terms of new store openings and doing deals for new stores. Investors are slow to spend when the market sentiment is so unclear. Sellers are not bringing properties to market. Banks are slow to lend when asset valuations are so up in the air as they are at the moment. And occupiers are reconsidering the requirements as we enter the new world post COVID-19. And again, we've, we've had to comment about that as everyone's going to be looking at their property portfolios. In particular, office occupiers will be stunned by the realisation of how much they can do without any office premises at all over the last seven weeks. But, but it always has, a, has a, a major impact on, on retail property going forward. And the point's been made that the property sector is, is an ecosystem. And when tenants cannot pay their rent, that impacts on landlords and the funders, that impacts on developers, that impacts on investment in the sector. And the vibrancy, the variety, the, the attraction of footfall are at best at the, at, the, at the heart of retail, at the heart of the best retail schemes and, and high streets. And so these qualities arise from the skill and dedication of landlords and their teams and property and asset managers. And if all of that's lost, then it will have an impact on traders and occupiers and, and retail schemes. Uh, in terms of, uh, this will lead property owners, investors and funders to a pretty tough place at the moment, but we're at a very interesting point in history. None of us ever expected to be here and the government have had to make some pretty momentous and, and generation defining decisions. They've had to decide between a healthy economy in the short term and a healthy population. But in the property sphere, they've had to make a choice between landlords and tenants. And much to the relief for now of retail tenants, the government has chosen to side with tenants. And I, I, I attended a recent uh, debate similar to this one, and it was banks and funders that were discussing it. And at that discussion, the view was put forward that the government must save occupiers because retailers, for example, they've got skills, they've got products, they've got jobs. Uh, these, are that, these, are, these are things that are hard to replace, hard to regrow from scratch in the short term. So there has to be a, a safety net to save these types of businesses. Uh, 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 but on the other hand, if landlords go bust, is that such an issue? That, that's, that's something that, that, that's openly being discussed. You know, if a landlord goes bust, property assets are redistributed to the market, they're repriced and the whole property cycle starts again. So pretty brutal pretty brutal analysis, but it's a case of the government looks to be look, looking to save jobs and perhaps cut landlords loose a little bit. Now, is it as stark as that? Well, we'll see in time, uh, but perhaps these are the discussions that, that the government are having to have at such a time of crisis. In terms of lockdown, we're, we're now at the beginning, sorry, we're now at the end of the beginning in terms of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, and, and we can see what's happened in the property world up to this point. A lot of this will be familiar to you, but going into lockdown, all businesses will have been thinking about costs associated with, with their premises. So that's thinking about costs at a time where you're not using your premises, you're not using your shops, your warehouses, your offices, and also at a time when cash flows were and businesses were projected to steeply decline. So the government had to act swiftly on this, and they did. Uh, most commercial tenants in England would have been facing their quarterly rent payments on the 25th of March. And so those tenants and, and, and leases in, in England were, were about to come under immediate pressure immediately after the lockdown was announced. So uh, something had to be done. Rates payable on commercial premises uh, has long been a sore point for many occupiers, most notably in the retail sector. And again, this was quickly becoming a point of focus. So 
The UK government responded by passing legislation which stopped landlords taking action to terminate leases for non-payment of rent until 30th June 2020. The Scottish government quickly followed suit by extending the period of notice required in order to terminate Scottish leases from four weeks to 14 weeks, and the Scottish provisions are due to last until 30th September for the moment. In terms of rates, you'll all be familiar with the fact that there's a number of initiatives out there, but the 12 months rates holiday for retail, leisure and hospitality businesses has obviously been in the headlines. The government wanted to take the pressure off and create space for landlords and tenants to discuss the consequences of the emerging crisis. Now, obviously they acted quickly, there has been a degree of success in that, but it has to be made clear that nothing that the government did stopped rents from falling due for tenants. There's no waiver of rent obligations or any other obligations under leases. What they've done is to put in place measures to stop what they're calling aggressive landlords uh, from making their commercial tenants homeless at a time of crisis. And, and they have taken further uh, measures to bolster that position. What we are seeing as a consequence of all of this is that in the leisure sector, many restaurant occupiers have decided simply not to pay rent for up to three months and landlords, whether, whether landlords are accepting that or not. In retail, we've been involved in a number of negotiations, but I'm also aware of retailers, large and small, who have stopped paying rent without any consensus from their landlord. Uh, and, and it becomes very difficult because it's a no-fault situation Landlords are not at fault, tenants are not at fault. This is just a, a situation that has, has arisen and, and you know, the parties are having to deal with as best they can. But inevitably, the most successful outcomes that we're seeing are arising where there's open discussion between landlords and tenants. Uh, and in many cases, we're seeing compromise and agreement arrived at more swiftly where the tenants are able to offer something in return. And that might be an extension to an existing lease in return for a rent holiday. As that gives the tenant the relief they need right now, but it also means that the landlord's investment position is improved going forward. So it's that kind of uh, quid pro quo arrangement, uh, or, or some some variation on the theme of that, can can find success. Not to say that all discussions are successful or pleasant, and there are aggressive landlords and tenants on both sides fighting their corners, as you would expect. Um, and many landlords are just choosing to do nothing just now and. Uh, hold course for the moment and, and see what happens, which, which of course creates uncertainty for tenants. But we're coming out of lockdown, so looking from where we currently stand to, to the road ahead, Boris Johnson is telling us shops can reopen from the beginning of June, unless the scientists are, are strongly against that. Uh, and so we are, where we are is at the beginning of the next stage coming out of lockdown and the next theme for property owners and occupiers is going to be about a sustainable recovery and unfreezing properties. For practical issues, getting back into properties will allow a great deal of estate management activity which has been on pause to recommence. So building surveys, rent reviews, maintenance, fitting out, refurbishment, all of that stuff can restart. Uh, but there's obviously going to be a, a, a great deal of, of practical uh, issues arising in terms of health and safety requirements and the like. For property management, uh, and this, this is something which we'll, you all, all understand will have a great impact, landlords of shopping centres and retail parks and even on the high street, there's going to be a huge issue around managing common parts and, and high streets, so shopping malls, car parks, servicing and staff areas, these are all going to be a particular challenge. And that's going to require landlords to scrutinise and occupiers to scrutinise occupational leases and to ensure that landlords are keeping within the rules agreed with their tenants in terms of how they implement measures. But also, all parties are going to have to understand whether the costs relating to health and safety measures can be recharged to tenants through service charge. And so there'll be a lot of thought given to enhanced cleaning rotas and sanitisation stations and new signage and et cetera, but, but who's going to pay for it is going to be a question. Uh, and a lot of that will, will depend on the circumstances and the underlying legal documentation. From, from my perspective as a lawyer, going forward, uh, I can expect that commercial leases are going to be for shorter durations and they're going to be on more flexible terms. And that's going to reflect a number of things, but in particular, the caution that businesses are feeling post-crisis. You can also expect a lot of time to be spent negotiating COVID clauses and leases. And the focus here, of course, is going to be about rent abatement uh, and rent holidays during a period where tenants are unable to occupy their property. 
Now, the vast majority of commercial leases at the moment will not cater for a rent holiday in the case of a pandemic. It's going to be a topic of discussion going forward. Whether tenants are going to win that battle with the landlords is something which remains to be seen and will, will, will depend on a number of factors and, and, and commercial decision making. Going forward, the government's response, we, we need to see what that's going to be. Um, we, we heard the announcement yesterday from the Chancellor regarding the jobs retention and furlough scheme, but various property industry and retail sector bodies, including the British Retail Consortium, have been asking for a furlough scheme which can be applied in a similar way to inactive properties. And that could see some level of payment being made direct to landlords as a contribution towards rent payments on mothballed shops and restaurants, etc. And obviously, with restaurants and leisure businesses due to being inactive for some time yet, such assistance perhaps could be targeted at that sector in the first instance. But as a final point, I would say that property uh, payments and rents and all the rest of it, it's a cyclical business and so you can't take your eye off the calendar. And the next quarter rent payment date in Scotland will be very soon on the 28th of May. In England, it will be 24th of June which is just before the government's ban on termination of leases is lifted. And each of these dates is going to bring renewed focus and discussion and pressure for landlords and tenants. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that continues to, continues to play out and what, what further government support that we're likely to see. Um, but my view, very interesting time for us, for us to be living through. Uh, huge challenges, but, but hopefully uh, a, a lot to be learned and, and, and to be gained along the way. Bricks and mortar, uh, everybody's moving online. The latest figures are showing that online sales have soared 60% over the last three months. So uh, is, is bricks and mortar going to have to change substantially? We, we, we will see. Um, that, that's a quick check through that. I'm, I'm going to hand over to, to Lynn now uh, and, and, and hopefully we can, we can have a wee bit of discussion uh, after Lynn's spoken. Thanks. Thanks very much, Graham. Um, I'll, I'll try to, to do this as, as quickly as I can so that we can have the dis discussion that you mentioned. Um, I think everyone recognises that protecting the health and safety of employees in any workplace must be paramount. Um, as an unprecedented public health emergency, the coronavirus has left businesses struggling to comply with their legal obligations. There was specific legislation passed at record speed in response to the threat of the virus. Guidance has been changing almost daily. And now with regional variations coming to the fore, heads are literally spinning when it comes to, to compliance and keeping track. Retail has seen the highs and lows, and we've certainly seen that firsthand with clients from hugely creative diversity and approaches from clients seeking to ensure that they comply with um, any uh, appropriate safety requirements in relation to changing um, changing products from uh, producing hand sanitizers to restaurants turning to food delivery and grocery boxes um, to many stores including some big names closing for the last time with related job losses so it's fair to say this is just the beginning of, of what's going to be a gradual and potentially messy reopening of business and none of us really know what the what the new normal is going to look like but you know in the face of adversity there's also opportunity for change and positive change um, and hopefully we can come out of that uh, in that way the regulatory framework that is now in place to manage the public health threat that's been created by the virus and provide enforcement powers is broadly similar across the UK Specific businesses have been required to close, others specifically permitted to remain open, subject to taking reasonable measures to comply with social distancing, and other non-essential businesses have chosen to close in light of public health guidance that's been issued. It's hit the retail sector hard, um, uh, and you know th that cannot be ignored. The review of the coronavirus regulations and restrictions last week has led to one minor change at the moment in Scotland, there's others extensively reported which apply to England, not to Scotland, which is, is leading to some confusion. But it's important to look at what's not changed yet. The, the law on who must work from home hasn't changed yet. The law on who may go to work has not changed. The law on which businesses must remain closed is not changed. 
and the furlough scheme remains open and indeed it's been extended to October, which is a, a positive sign. And the messaging all suggests a gradual change to be expected rather than falling off a cliff and everyone expected to be back to, to business as normal. But what is clear is that change is coming. Um, it needs to come and, it, and it's coming across the UK. The key in managing safety uh, and ensuring compliance is to be prepared wherever you are and to um, use uh, a phrase that's been coined by uh, the UK government to stay alert to changes in guidance. England is now actively encouraging a return to work when working at home is not possible, which is entirely relevant to the retail sector. Um, and they're mapping a potential reopening of non-essential shops around June, as you're all aware. While currently, currently adopting a more cautious approach, even if Scotland doesn't follow the same time scale, it's reasonable to assume we are not going to be far behind. Regardless of location, change is coming and a full lockdown is going to ease, which has severe implications in relation to managing the safety and the health threat associated by the virus. So while everyone is talking about how we can get retail open, the bigger underlying question is how do you keep employees and customers safe? The law on health and safety, which is UK-wide, has not changed. The new coronavirus legislation and public health guidance operates in addition to and alongside existing health and safety duties, which are incumbent upon all employers, including the general legal duty to take all reasonable practicable steps to ensure the health, safety and welfare at work of all employees. And that general duty to employees extends to protecting others that may be affected by work activities, including contractors and the general public. And importantly for retail, that means your customers. So these duties are onerous with significant legal risks for non-compliance. Failure to comply with health and safety duties are criminal offences, and that can lead to prosecution and corporate liability uh, for the business itself. Um, Regulatory investigations and enforcement inevitably lead to business disruption and a requirement to deploy resources, whether that's defending any enforcement action or um, even just responding to queries and uh, managing an investigation appropriately to reduce exposure for any business. It's also worth pointing out that uh, the impact on any reputational uh, aspects of your business, you know, just cannot be um, ignored and, and really quant quantified. It's likely to be significant, particularly in these times with the publicity and scrutiny around the, the virus. It's worth pointing out that there's, under the health and safety legislation, there's the scope for individual liability in relation to corporate liability for health and safety failings. The regulator has a powerful, a powerful tool in being able to hold senior management to account for decisions relating to health and safety, where they lead to health and safety failings in duties, with all that that means. And by that, I mean ultimately prosecution for individuals um, as well as a company. Uh, for individuals, that means th there's a real risk that you could go to jail. And certainly, we've seen the regulator using that tool in recent years. And it will be interesting to see um, longer term as, as this matter progresses, and we have cautionary tales of, of people falling foul of the guidance uh, and the way that they're managing health and safety duties, how that actually uh, pans out. The coronavirus uh, regulations themselves include similar terms for uh, individual liability for senior managers of businesses for failing <laughs> to managing the issues. So the risks associated with the virus are grave, the stakes are high and planning is key. Success in managing health and safety reopening will depend on strong leadership, driving the right culture and strategy, making informed decisions with the assurance that a retailer is complying with their legal duties. We've seen safety measures in pharmacies and supermarkets developing as our knowledge and understanding of the virus increases, and those are going to become commonplace. The broad advice that it remains that anyone who can work from home should continue to do so. However, all of our clients are now looking ahead at how to reopen their businesses and return people to work where they cannot work from home. 
and for retail, reviewing which stores can open safely and the changes needed to support reopening are key. Now, for retail, that presents practical considerations, um, in particular, ensuring safety while maintaining viable sales levels and not impacting on any customer experience. So what, what can you do? Planning at present involves drawing up a, a comprehensive risk assessment process and consulting on the risk assessments with employees. There's a legal requirement to do that. Any risk assessments will need to take account of government safety guidelines and also global guidance, which is, it is changing at a dramatic pace. You can contract out the work in some instances, for example, cleaning and hygiene, which is safe enhanced hygiene that may be required. But any um, employer cannot contract out of their legal duties in relation to health and safety. And insurance is not going to cover fines for health and safety failings. Um, these are criminal offences and uh, would require to, to come out of the, the business's own pocket. Where there's a divergence in approach between guidance, for example, in relation to devolved nations, as we've seen over recent days um, in the last week, a business which operates in, in different jurisdictions will require to comply with more stringent requirements. The guidance itself is not law unless it's stated as being mandatory, but any deviation in guidance has to be reported, would have to be supported by a robust risk assessment. At the moment, for retail, the key risk considerations that we're seeing are which stores to open, when, which employees to bring back and when, and the measures that need to be put in place to ensure a safe return and customer experience. Putting people at the heart of um, your efforts for retail is going to be another key factor because trust and confidence in your efforts from both your employees and your customer base is going to be essential. Early and transparent communication with employees is the first part of that. And if you are thinking about reopening and uh, getting stores and businesses up and running, you need to think about the guidance on any protocols that you may be developing, how you are going to do that and communicate that to your employees, whether that could be email, online training or video. You may have employees on furlough, which could present challenges in relation to communication. And if you recognise a trade union, then you ha must engage with the health and safety representative for the trade union. An early engagement should help ensure understanding and buy-in to any of your plans. The retail se sector faces similar issues um, as any business in relation to assessing the risks associated with, with COVID and the infection control and preventing the spread of the virus. Some of the issues that will come to the fore will be around the requirements for PPE and there may be issues around availability and sourcing of that. You'll need to consider shift patterns, movement of employees, both um, in the workplace and also transport uh, and travel to the workplace. Health screening will have to be considered. You'll need to take account of vulnerable employees and special measures that may need to be put in place. Access and egress to the workplace where there's multiple occupancy um, will be a key issue in, for retail. With We're already seeing some large uh, retailers across the world developing ingenious um, uh, ways of coping with queuing systems and traffic flow for uh, having customers coming back to the, to the stores. Social distancing in the workplace is going to be the biggest challenge. Uh, tapes on the floors, limited number of baskets, plexiglass screens are all really just the start. Toilets, kitchen, communal areas, including gyms in any buildings, which could have contractual implications if sourced externally will be issues. Meetings and travel for business and any restrictions which may remain on that may be key for, for certain aspects and, and certain retailers. Third party risks, your contractors coming in, uh, uh, and I already mentioned multiple occupancy buildings are another issue. First aiders and fire marshals, there may be specific requirements that need to be put in place in relation to them and further training. Um, enhanced hygiene, customer returns, use of touch screens, cashless payments are all just what part of the myriad of things which will have to be considered. When thinking about reopening your stores, there may be statutory inspections required of some of your equipment. Um, while some health and safety aspects um, around inspections may have been relaxed under lockdown, certain statutory inspections still remain in place and you should be sh in ensure that you check that 
um, and that any equipment that requires to be inspected is inspected prior to reopening. There's also the issue of Legionella risks in buildings which may have been sitting um, dormant during lockdown, and you should properly consider that in addition to uh, the myriad of other risks that I've mentioned. Um, insurance is something that you should consider, uh, particularly when there's been material changes in relation to the way that you're operating. It may affect your policy. But generally, your compliance policies for employees, there's a number of those that may require to be reviewed in light of the health and safety management and mitigation measures that you, you require to put in place in relation to the virus. And with that, I'm thinking about sickness, disciplinary, driving at work, testing, health and safety generally. And if you have workers who are remaining to work at home, you may also want to think about implementing a proper risk assessment for home working. All of that should be subject to monitor review and any changes implemented in what is going to be a, a dynamic situation. Now, while a return to some form of normality and reopening is desired, it shouldn't be pressured or rushed. Many measures are going to take significant time and resources. It might not be a case of just opening the door. Any strategy which puts uh, profit before safety is risky, and it leaves open the door to enforcement in relation to health and safety failings including the possibility of individual liability that I mentioned. It may require difficult decisions. There are some measures that may not be practical or viable for business. And um, while that's harsh, uh, it's the, the reality of the new normal that we're facing. Gover the government can't order anyone back to work. If an employer doesn't think it's safe, um, they're not obliged to resume operations. And indeed, doing so would be a criminal offence in relation to health and safety were they to do so. In essence, you need to clearly communicate and to demonstrate a commitment to providing a safe environment for staff and customers going forward. There's no one size fits all or an easy answer here, but with the right culture and the right strategy, you should be able to drive the right way forward. So I'm happy to take questions. I think we've, we're sort of at the end of our time limit, but I, I'm happy to stay on and, and have chat and answer any questions if any.